Hey everybody, this is Brad Dyke saying hi, just uh, doing my software part of the equation for the video work. Today we're going to talk about a very important question. I have so much money, do I go 2.5 gigabit networking right back there? You see that little white switch? Or do I go 10 gig? And that's what that switch is, a 10 gig switch. Now, the key detail about 10 gig switches versus 2.5 is 10 is very well established and there's quite a bit out there and it's actually surprisingly cost effective but 2.5 gigabit native is also pretty cool too and you could use quad cards to accomplish those kind of bandwidths which are the same kind of cost but when you start to investigate buying a 2.5 gigabit switch versus a 10 gigabit switch here you see basically eight gbit ports and these basically right here let me pull this out here you see right there is an empty slot there and you'll put a gbit in may it be a copper may it be rj45 or may it be fiber and this is a what we call backbone switch and the backbone switch is for point-to-point -point high data volume ma management that relates to I don't know, you would say something like um, file, uh, true NAS, core file servers, and um, of course, tying into other infrastructure switches, right? So this, this is all very valuable and very important. Now, um, with this, I also have in the back here another switch, 10 gig switch. It was about $120, and it's a four port. And as you can see right there is the bridge connection for it, and I've got another extended connection over here. Now, that gives me a total of 12 ports, but I lose two ports to bridge those two together. So I actually only have 10 ports I can use. So, you know, this switch cost me $250. This is a Microtech, and it's a cloud router switch. It's a great little management switch, but it's also because it's a Microtech, it's not within the United States. So I have to back end it. Uh, I don't necessarily say it's a bad switch. I don't say it's a great switch. It's just a good overall standard switch. This is a back-end network switch. This is my front-end network switch right down here. The back-end is designed to deal with high-intensity 10 gig to 10 gig transfers. You do the same thing with a 2.5 gigabit, but the problem with 2.5 gigabit switches is you're going to get you're going to get 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5 across each point, and you times that by the total number of ports, with a 5% increase for the uplink side, uh, and then that's your total bandwidth on the back end of the switch. This guy is a heck of a lot more capable than that, uh, where you might be getting close to 25 gigabit to 30 gigabit buses. For your switch on a 2.5 gigabit switch, here you on a 10 gig, you're just short of a 100 gigabit back, backbone. That's important because each one of these ports gives me 10 gigabit, but it's IP gigabit. So that means I lose 20% to overhead for each one of these. So these are technically actually 8 gigabit ports. The same rule of thumb applies to 2.5 gigahertz. So if you, uh, gigabit, sorry. The key detail about that is the same overhead that 10 gig switches, 1 gig switches, and 100 megabyte switches have is the TCP overhead that you have to count when you're doing your bandwidth. That's why, you know, when you're on a 1 gig architecture, you can only see 8, about 8 megs of transfer sustained rates. And it's always that 20% that gets cut off. Sometimes it's a little faster, sometimes it's a little slower. So your 2.5 gigabit bandwidth is not 2.5 gigabit bandwidth. That's where I'm starting to say, hey, you know, I'm putting my money in a 2.5 gigabit switch or I'm putting my money in a 10 gig switch and I'm looking at somewhere around 7.5 to 8.5 gigabit bandwidths. I want to buy a 10 gig switch. Now, here's a, one crucial detail. Don't buy a large 10 gigabit switch. It's unrealistic. You don't run your core infrastructure all on 10 gigabit. That flattens your network. What you want to do instead is you want to have the top bandwidth at the very high of your pyramid of bandwidth. 
the slowest part of your bandwidth is actually going to come from your ISP provider, you know, 100 megabit or whatever that would be. So at the top, you've got for all the heavy data intensive stuff or your server to server only communications, 10 gigabit. Then you're connecting one gigabit connections for the outbound to the world. And that is going to go through your next slowest connection, and that's going to be your ISP provider. Now, in my environment, that's not quite the, the case. I have a one gigabit ISP outbound connection, fiber. Then I have duplexed one gigabit pathways. That means it's definitely better performance, but it's still one gigabit architecture. I have a faster read-write transfer rates because I can write simultaneously, opposed to a single connection, which is just write or read. With that being said, then I go up into my normal house network of one gigabit. And then from there, I go up to the 10 gigabit for all the server processes. So because of that, the key detail here is to make sure I'm only using these valuable ports for what I need to use them. So this is where the money starts to count up. I have only a limited number of servers that are using 10 gigabit because I only have a special need for that. And it's always in pairs because you're going to have one server down here talking to a server over here, but they're communicating on a 10 gigabit bus because they have to transfer data as fast. So right here, as you can see in this design, I do have one gigabit outbound connections for general internet connectivity, but then I have another VLAN that would be focused on data transfers. These NICs cost money whenever type you connect. And as you can see, I have three different kinds of NICs. I have GBIC NICs that can do copper, or they could be they could do GBICs with fiber like you see here. Uh, this is a copper version, which means there's no fiber using this very specialized copper variation. And then you have these RJ45 style connections that are no different than a normal network cable, but they're in cards that are cost effective. And that's where the money is saved. Always buy server 10 gigabit cards. Don't buy the PC 10 gigabit, gigabit cards unless, you know, you just need to save money. Uh, the, the NTUs on server cards are much better than the ones on PC standard workstations. The other key thing you want to do is make sure that when you add up the cost, you add up the cost of how you're going to connect. Now, 10 point, uh, 2.5 gigabit connections, yes, are just RFJ45 connections. But you have flexibility here. If I can find cheap fiber cards versus cheap, uh, uh, G, well, I'm sorry, uh, cheap GBIT cards, and I can find a few 10 gig NIC cards, like these two right here, I'm gonna use them. So the last thing you have to understand that when you're gonna figure out your cost is what are you going to lose? That is a very important question. So I lose two ports here to connect two 10 gig switches together for a total of 10 available ports. Now with that, I have what's called the uplink bridge port because I wanna keep fiber as fiber, and that's what I'm doing here, opposed to running copper down here for my ISP. So this one is my ISP connection to the world. This guy is dedicated to a data archive and I have another data archive out there as well. So with that being the case, that means that my archiver, which is this blue cable right here, and this guy right here, which is another one, that's a file server, are my pairs. Now, lastly, I have one more connection that's going to bring in other switches like down here right here as you can see it's already it's connected up and stuff uh, and that is a platform and it is also as you can see over here running fiber so how many ports do you have to sacrifice potentially to bring 12 ports into a 10 gigabit architecture for your service well the answer is four that's right four so uh, the four ports I added was to help compensate for the loss of the ports I knew I'd have to deal with. This is the same problem with the 2.5 8-port cards or the 12-port cards. Uh, when you start to bring in all your infrastructure, you start to realize, well, you know, I don't have that much. But you definitely don't want to buy a giant 10-gig switch or a 2.5 because they're just so unreasonable cost-wise. You're going to have to wait till they get put out on eBay. I love my Nortel switch down here. You know, it's got a, a full dual dual one gig architecture fiber which i stopped using because of the standard of that gbic that's there 
Uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt to work with. But all in all, I still love this switch. It's a great front-end switch. It does all my core infrastructure connectivity to the world. But then I've got this guy nice and secure and buttoned away. And it gives me all the bandwidth. And it's pretty much exactly the same amount of cost as if I went with a 2.5 giga, gigabit switch setup. So it wasn't worth it. I, I say go 10 gigabit. That's the right way to go because it's just going to be a long time before you have to go back and take it out. So with that being said, I wanted to just touch base on this particular discussion because it's important to understand the the nature of, you know, your money versus what you're going to get the best for your buck, right? So that's why I say even though 2.5 is a cool, eclectic kind of idea, um, you know, it's another niche in a market that's pretty saturated, uh, but 10 gig wins every time. Now, do you say, screw that, screw this, I'm going to go 100 megabit? Mm, I wouldn't. Not really. For several reasons. You know, 100 megabit switches are not cheap, even when they're small. And um, 100 megabit NICs are not cheap either. And, you know, you can only do them in pair sets. In other words, you have two NIC cards in two separate sources in your local LAN only. And that would have to be a backup server and one or more file servers uh they could all transfer their data in 100 megabit i'm sorry 100 gig gigabit and that's pretty much it so you don't get a true return now if you had built out a really decent proxmox environment you had 10 gig switches uh let's say two 10 gig switches with failover pathways and they have a 100 megabit uplink to a 100 meg switch that was then connecting to a true nas platform with a 100 gigabit switch in it, it as well those 100 gig connections would work and you could do probably 125 to 175 VMs with performance output off of that 100 gigabit connection. That's feasible, but that's five to seven thousand dollars too, by the way, not cheap. So that's why I don't think it's practical to put 100 gigabit out there yet until something else comes out like dual, dual duplexing 100 gigabit or you know, 250 or or 500 gigabit type switches. That will drive that cost down. And then it might be feasible to do it if it's cost effective, that is. But this is Brad Dyke just talking to you about this, and I'm going to let you go. You guys take care. Bye-bye.